The India Middle East Europe Economic Corridor announced at the G20 summit goes back to an ancient trade route between the Indian subcontinent and the Roman Empire. The existence of this trade route peaked in the early centuries of the common era and it's been known for a long time. However, the scale of this ancient trade route is emerging only now. Uh, William Darylimple, well-known author, historian, has a new upcoming book, The Golden Road, which delves into this subject in detail. And William Darylimple now joins us on the news track. In fact, his argument is that this is a far more significant trade route than even the uh, Silk Route, which China is trying to push as its idea for the Bells uh, and Road Initiative. So, thank you very much, Mr. Darylimple. Uh, for joining us from London. Absolute pleasure having you with us. Could you start by explaining to our viewers as we look at this India uh, Mideast Europe corridor in the current geopolitical context, can you give us a historical context in terms of the ancient roots of this trading route? Ms. Darylumpal, welcome. Sure. I think when people anywhere in the world think about trade between Europe and Asia, the first thing that now comes to their mind is the idea of the Silk Road. Uh, that's this concept of a, an overland route, very romantic idea of camel caravans laden with silk and spices crossing the Pamirs. And the traditional conception of this is something that links China with the Mediterranean, with, uh, uh, with the Roman world uh, uh, in the Mediterranean. Uh, but actually, the the Silk Road is a very modern idea. It was only invented in the 19th century by a German geographer called von Richthofen. It only came into the English language in the 1930s and only really became popular in the last 20 or 25 years and has in a sense been militarized by uh, Xi Jinping and the idea of the Belt and Road, the idea that this is a, an ancient trade route that could be revived. While if you look at the classical period mm -hmm. at the time of the Romans, uh, the the big east-west trade route was nothing to do with China at all. It was with India, and it happened not over land, but over the sea, mm -hmm. up the Red Sea. And what allowed Indian sailors and the Romans to come backwards and forth with surprising ease was the winds of the monsoon. The Tibetan plateau heats up in summer and it cools in winter. And this creates a a, a very predictable wind pattern, which allows you to sail from India to the Red Sea, to the Egyptian coast, in as little as six weeks if you've got the wind behind you. You then have to wait for the wind to turn, but you can then come back when it does in an equally quick time. Five or six weeks is all it takes to sail from, from Egypt to India. Okay. And, at the, and at the time of the Romans, this wasn't just a sort of something that a few explorers and intrepid mariners did. This was a major world uh, economic route. And we have a, a records of the Roman geographer and economist Pliny complaining that all the gold in the Roman world was bucketing out towards India because he said he was a very puritanical ex-soldier and he said that all these Roman decadent Roman women want to wear silk from India, they want gems to cover their breasts, uh, they want all this sort of foreign exotica he's saying, why can't they just be happy with good you know, Roman wool uh, and he says that there were 250 Roman cargo vessels alone, leaving just one port a year in his in his time, uh, and sailing to India. And, and, and the, the ports in India was Baruch, which is uh, modern uh, Gujarat, um, Muziris, which is near Cochin in Kerala, uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the Poduke, which is the, beneath modern Pondicherry. Could you explain the nature of this trade? What is the kind of uh, material that Indian merchants were carrying to Europe? What's the kind of material that was coming uh, from Europe to India? What was the balance of this trade? Were we exporting more? Were we importing more? How did this trade really operate? We don't really know. What's clear from Pliny is that the balance of trade in terms of uh, who's who's making the money is that the Indians were making the money. That the money is it, that the Indians didn't want to buy much from Rome. They were interested in Roman wine. Uh, they liked Roman olive oil. They also liked a sauce called garum, which was a very popular fish sauce, uh, which which we, has actually been found in several port cities in India by archaeologists. It used to be exported in great big barrels. Uh, but um, 
in return, the Romans wanted very expensive things like ivory, spices, and gemstones. So the balance of trade overwhelmingly was in favor of India. And that's why you find tens of thousands of uh, finds in India of, of Roman coins. In fact, there have been mm -hmm. more Roman coins found in India than in any other country except Italy. You know, but uh, there's so much talk about the Silk Road trade from China, Xi Jinping trying to present that as a historical fact over uh, projecting the, the importance of the ancient Silk Route. From what you say, it seems that this spice route in the classical period is the actual uh, route where a majority of the global trade happens. So why is it that there isn't enough known about the importance of this ancient route in contemporary times. Why is it seemingly such a novel idea when Biden, Modi, Mohammed bin Salman all announce it? You know, the historical significance doesn't immediately come to people's minds. Well, you're quite right. Well, there's two or three answers to that. First of all is that history, like everything else, goes in fashions, just like, you know, there are fashions in hemlines or the cut of a, a shirt or the, or the way you wear a sari or whatever. Um, so in history, there are fashions. And this idea of the Silk Road is such a romantic and exciting idea that it's slightly taken over everyone's uh, sort of consciousness in the last 20 years. And we've forgotten to look at the hard data, which is there very clearly in, in the Roman uh, in the Roman documents and in, and in the archaeology, which is dug up. The second reason, I think, is that Indian scholars are very, very good at doing their scholarly writing, but there's been less of a tradition of popularizing their research to ordinary people. I think that's beginning to change now with writers like, you know, Manu Pillai or Anirudh Kunisetti coming up uh, and making very good scholarly history accessible. But uh, for years, I think, you know, the, the work that scholars was doing was obscured by a lot of jargon in subaltern studies language and this sort of thing. So people were not reading the research that Indian scholars were doing. Uh, and I think the third thing is there's a lot of new evidence. There's uh, th There's been excavations in the last 10 years in Kerala at Maziris. There have been new excavations on the old site of the excavations that Mortimer Wheeler made at Arakamedu outside Pondicherry. And most excitingly, there's been a major excavation in Egypt at the, at the, the main port that the Indian sailors used on arrival which was a place called Berenike. And in the last couple of years, they found not only a wonderful Silikandaran style Buddha head, uh, the first ever found in Egypt uh, and, and made locally, made in Alexandria, they think. But they've also found a very early triad of Hindu gods um, of the uh, early forms of Krishna and Balarama. Um, and this turned up just last year, hasn't even been fully published yet. So uh, there are um, there are, there's a wonderful, anyone wants to go on YouTube, there's a, a wonderful archaeologist called Shailen Bandari, who's been talking about this uh, at the Eshmolean, uh, about Berenike, you can find that if you if you look online. But it's, it's new evidence, uh, and, and it's changing the picture. But the most exciting single piece of evidence, and this is the thing, in a sense, I, I think people should take away with them, is something called the Musiris Papyrus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is now in, it's a piece of, it's a piece of uh, historical document, uh, a, a papyrus dug up in Egypt, probably at a, a site called Oxyrhynchus. It's now kept in a museum in Vienna. And when they studied it, the, it was a random survival in a rubbish dump. Someone had cleared out their house, all their doc papers got thrown into a heap, and the archaeologists dug it up. And what it is, is a random um, shipping invoice taken a contract taken out by an Alexandrian Greek ship owner in the city of Alexandria, uh, uh, making a contract with a supplier, a merchant in Kerala. And it's a very modern document. They're, they're listing the contents of the container. Um, there's details about insurance, about, uh, you know, there's, there's various legal uh, uh, things about what happens if the thing sinks and so on. And this document involves vast sums of money. A single mm -hmm. container full of ivory uh, uh, that is put on one ship called the Hamapalon is listed out in this contract. And that container alone would have allowed the merchant, if it successfully arrived, safely avoided storms and sinking and, uh, and pirates and everything else. If, if the whole thing arrived safely, the merchant would be able to buy one of the largest estates in India or Italy in its day. Wow. Uh, he, he would be like, you know, an Adani or a Ambani uh, of, of Kerala, uh, aged, you know, in 100 AD. And if 
one of these big Roman container ships, because we know the size of the berths of them mm -hmm. at Berenike. They found the harbour where they used to dock, and they were enormous ships. Uh, obviously, smaller than a modern container, but, you know, a very large ancient ship could contain hundreds of these uh, containers. And it, we know that just in one port, nearly 250 ships a year sailed to India, uh, wow. both of both Roman and India, you begin to feel this. The, and so they've done calculations and they found that the customs take when the, the, the Roman customs at the, at the port demand a third of the value of this. The customs take from that one port alone would have paid for one third of the Roman imperial budget. So wow. in other words, it's, it's a vast source of wealth wow. for the Roman exchequer. The very, very pricey luxuries coming in at their port in Egypt, entering the Roman Empire, and they take a cut of it. Uh, and that alone would have paid for one third of the entire military budget of the Empire. So, so we're talking vast sums of money. And it's, as a historian, to me, it's really interesting that, you know, modern politics has meant that this has been revived. There's various <laughs> reasons for that. But again, it's partly revived, I think, in competition with the Chinese. They have their Belt and Road, and they're promoting this historical idea of the Silk Road. Uh, and India, whether knowingly or unknowingly, has landed on a very ancient trade route that, in fact, probably was, was more important during the classical period than the Silk Road ever was. Wow, that's fascinating. So, so, so fascinating. Uh, boats and rail initiative of the modern era, as it were, to take on the Belt and Road initiative of Xi Jinping. So this is the trade that starts in India, goes to Europe, uh, William Darrell Impul. What's the role of the Arab world at that time in the early period of the classical era? What's the role of the Arab world in this trade? What's happening there? So, complicated question. So first of all, it, during the Roman times, the Arabs were not placed in a sense where we think of them today. So Egypt was not an Arab country in those days. Uh, and um, it, was, it was a Roman and, and a Greek and Egyptian country. Uh, there are three different races living in uh, in Egypt. Um, so the Arabs at that point contain control areas such as Yemen and Aden, which controlled the frankincense route. And that was another of the very important imports into the Roman Empire because it was what incense for temples was made from. Uh, and so that's part of it. But the famous period of Arab dominating uh, the, the sea road comes you know, in a later period, when you have the Mamluks in charge of Egypt in the 12th, 13th, 14th centuries. And that's another great period of sea trade between India and the Mamluks, because India, the coast of India has many Muslim principalities uh, on the western coast by that stage, who are trading directly with their co-religionists in Egypt and, uh, and the Gulf. So this is something which is an essential part of Indian history, simply because the monsoon winds have always allowed sailors to do this. All Indians need to do, unlike any other nation in the world, is put up a sail and they go in one direction for half the year and they go in the other direction in the other half. It's a, a major natural asset of India that it's always led to it being a great trading and seafaring nation. That's why you've got huge Indian diaspora all over the, West, you know, the, the uh, east coast of Africa. It's why you've got Hindu temples all over uh, Angkor Wat and the coast of Cambodia and Thailand. And this is the subject of my next book. It's called The Golden Road. It's about the diffusion of Indian ideas using those monsoon winds to take them all over the world, but also to use the overland route to take Buddhism to China. And we always forget that Buddhism and Indian religion uh, took over China for a bit of the Middle Ages. And, and that with Buddhism came ideas about uh, yugas of time, Indian ideas of astronomy, astrology, magic, uh, all sorts of Indian conceptions came, if you like, sort of hostage with the religion. As Buddhism became popular in China, so many other aspects of Indian science and, and Indian astronomy came with it. Okay. So there's a whole world that we've forgotten about the export of Indian ideas. And it's not in distant Vedic past. It's not some stuff, you know, some people get very overexcited about the Vedic past and start talking about, you know, Internet and the Mahabharata and spaceships in, 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 in the Ramayana and this sort of thing. It's none of that sort of highfalutin thing. This is solid historical stuff that's happening, particularly between the first and second century uh, BCE through to about the 11th, uh, 11th or 12th century uh, CE. 
So about a thousand years, India is exporting its ideas, exporting its science uh, uh, in a very real and tangible way. And, and you don't need to be a sort of hyper-nationalist to, 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 to see this in very clear terms, the way that it, China becomes a Buddhist country, Southeast Asia has, has future Buddhist and Hindu monuments, and eventually Indian numbers and Indian science spreads first to the Arab world and finally belatedly in the 12th century to Europe, which is why we use Indian-derived numbers today. Such a fascinating historical insight this. William Darrell Impul for joining me on the news track. Thank you very much. Absolute pleasure, sir. Thank you.